Christy, I will tell you something. I would love nothing more than just to, well, no, actually, there is things I'd love more. But I would very much be interested in just bringing you in a room together and showing you some of the best break dancing uh, that I've, I've seen before. Uh, my little pinned thread on Twitter is some of my, some of my personal favorite break dancing. Uh, but we have other things to do. And know that I know that I need to follow what you've seen with what I'm going to be doing, which is, you know, it's a tech talk. So, like, you're not going to see that sort of athleticism, perhaps maybe verbally. But, uh, <laughs> but, but what I'm going to do here, be in the first, uh, the first session for you guys right after the keynote, so happy to be here, is bring as much enthusiasm as I can because I am so, so excited to be here in Oslo with all of you. It's so exciting. So, hi! Oh, you know, that's really good. That's really, you know, there's, there's times that I've done this before that I've kind of like tried to get people up, you know, like, okay, hey, hi, we're going to do, do this thing together. Here I am in Norway. You know the stereotypes. And so I was like, well, okay, okay, let's take these, these solid people and, and let's, uh, these stoic people and let's, you know, give them the enthusiasm of, of sitting in a sauna. But no, no, you're all with me. I'm so excited. So my name is Lemon. Uh, I make websites. I've been making websites for a long time. Uh, I've been doing websites uh, professionally for well over a decade, uh, nearly two. And uh, I do that for money. Uh, I do it for fun uh, because I am a freak. Uh, <laughs> uh, so if you go to like ahoelemon.xyz, you get a whole bunch of dumb games that I've made because I think that it's fun to make uh, silly games as well as uh, doing this thing. Uh, for clients, um, because the web is very exciting to me. It's an interesting thing to develop for, and that's why I wanted to talk to you, because today I want to talk to you about performance, by which I mean website performance. Now, okay, that is not the most exciting topic. You know, it's not, it's not like I didn't title this, like, I'll shrink the web. I didn't go like, uh, website performance. But this is actually interesting. There's a lot of interesting things in web performance, and there's a lot of interesting easy wins that we can achieve. So I want to talk to you about today's agenda. So I'm going to go through three things right now. I've got three things, and those three things are, what is the problem? There's a whole bunch of problems in website performance. We're going to go through some of those. We have, why should I care? These, yes, I know that these are problems. I am a person, I want to spend time with my kids, I want a barbecue, yeah, what, why should I care about these little website problems? And then what should I do about it? I've got things that we can do right now to just do marginal improvements to your website performance. And then of course, how can I be happy? And by that I mean like with my website, like I'm not actually like, I'm not coming in here like Deepak Chopra, you know, trying to like fix all of your vibes or whatever. No, no, I'm not going to do that, but I am going to try to help you be happy with your website. So there will be a test, or rather there will be lots of tests. You're going to be doing testing, or rather you're going to let your browser do the testing for you, and we're going to get back to that. But before, now that I've baited you on the hook by saying, we're going to talk about website performance, and I'm going to test you. Ugh. Okay, let's play a game. Let's play a game. Let's play a game. And I got a game right here. That game is this one. So I'm sure we know, but shout it out if you know it. What? <laughs> Sorry, shout out the name of the game if you know it. Doom. There we go. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, of course, that is the video game Doom. Some facts about Doom. It's released by ID, id Software, not ID Software, id Software in 1993. You got John Carmack, uh, you got uh, uh, long haired, uh, silly man. Um, made, this, uh, made this game. It was played by 20 million people in the first two years. It popularized the first-person genre. There were first-person shooters before the game Doom, but it wasn't until Doom that it became a thing. And in fact, the reason why uh, first-person shooters are still a thing is just the incredible popularity uh, that Doom had. Sequels continue to this day. There was, you know, there's the Doom and the Doom Eternal, and I'm sure they're going to do plenty more because Bethesda needs more money. Uh, and it was built with its own custom game engine. All of those uh, early John Connor Mac uh, id game softwares, uh, they all shipped with an inter with a a, uh, their own game engine because uh, Carmack is a freak and wanted to rewrite the engine every single time. So this game, this game that completely changed video games uh, uh, at least, or one would say like the zeitgeist of, uh, of pop culture. This game weighed in at 2.39 megabytes when it was released. 
Now, you know, they had expansions and stuff like that. Some of that stuff ballooned up. But the actual release size, because they had to put it on disk, because it was important to put this on disk, because this was back in 1993, was 2.39 megabytes. Now then, I'm going to show you another thing. It's more recent. You know, and we talk about how uh, computer tech evolves and definitely gets more interesting. And so you can see this little video game, and you go like, well, that looks okay, but like, let's skip forward. Let's skip to forward to the year 2022, and let's see what's a cool piece of software now. Yeah, this is all full, 2017. Oops, it broke already. Never mind, here we go again. This is all full, 2017. Why is it called 2017? I don't know, because they're actually still releasing it in Theme Forest. So here we go, it's a website. You scroll down, it's kind of janky. And then, and then I keep scrolling down. Oh, there's some, there's some mobile screens. Oh, the parallax effect is just, ooh, there's hover effects on a stock photo of an old man. And then I've got some more parallax effects. There's some logos down here. There's some happy people. And my favorite, my favorite feature in a website is this button. Because I always, when I get down to the bottom of a website, what I end up doing is I go like, oh, here I am at the bottom of the website and I need to get back up. Oh no, how did I get here? How do I get, help, help, is there a button that can bring me back? Oh, it crashed again. Well, Unfold 2017, let's hear some facts about Unfold 2017. Now, I'm talking just about this homepage here. So this cost uh, $59 on Theme Forest, uh, you know, the typical way that people build WordPress websites. And I'm not saying that everyone builds WordPress websites, but I'm saying a lot of people build WordPress websites by this, is they go like, let me buy some crap, and then let me put your logo on there. And uh, that's kind of what uh, Theme Forest does. And it's got parallax, man. It's got uh, 35 images. It's got nine fonts. Uh, nine fonts. That's odd. And five scripts. For a, for a WordPress theme, uh, five scripts is uh, surprisingly short. Uh, 1,333 words. I think that's about the size of like a good Robert Frost poem. So probably about the same. And uh, this took. Uh, 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 more than 15 seconds on a 3G connection. What I'm saying is, is that I did this thing on a 3G connection, kept loading this page over and over again. Just over 15 seconds was the fastest it showed up. Uh, lots of times it was more into the uh, 20, 25 seconds. This is just the home page, And this was weighing in at 3.56 megabytes. Okay, so that means that this home page, Unfold 2017, uh, that means that it is weighing in at 148% the size of Doom. Now, you can ask, well, okay, is this website, is this homepage 148% as good as Doom? <laughs> yeah, pro I mean, well, I don't know. I couldn't definitely make that decision. I guess you all get to make that decision for you. I believe in, you know, sort of like equal measure. So you get to make the decision. Which of those two things did you find uh, a little bit more enjoyable? Um, but this is actually, this uh, uh, thing that uh, I've been saying here is the websites and comparisons to Doom. It's not actually my uh, original uh, idea. It was something that I got out of Wired. Uh, so this is a Wired Magazine article. I believe this article is from, yes, this article is from 2016. 2016. And Wired wrote, uh, the average web page is now the size of the original Doom. And uh, they started to do the math. You know, they were going through the top uh, million websites and kind of like taking that page load, comparing that against Doom, and said, you know, yes, the average web page is the size of the original Doom. And of course, you know, we know what uh, internet journalism looks like, which is that somebody writes a thing and then other people have to rewrite that thing. So the PC world, the average web page is now larger than Doom. Keeps making the rounds. Gets picked up by a website called geek.com. The average website web page is now larger than the original Doom. And so I was kind of looking at different sources and reading people's different copy-pasted takes on this particular idea. And when I was loading the geek.com article, I thought to myself, hey, why does this web page run like absolute garbage? So, so I just opened up Inspector and I said, well, okay, let's just do a little network tab and let's just see what's going on here. So the average web page is now larger than the, a than the actual Doom. Okay, so here we go. So we are at uh, 7, 8, 9, 10 megabytes. Now we're at a 12, 13, 14. We have now made 400 requests. Those are all necessary, I'm sure. We keep going here. I'm at, f I'm at 25 megabytes, 600 megabytes, sorry, sorry, uh, 26 megabytes, 800 requests. The average web page, this is all perfectly, perfectly necessary 
because, because, and this is the thing, is that, is that geek.com, I'm sure, has advertisers, and those advertisers have said, yes, of course, these 750 requests are absolutely necessary, and that's because people who work in advertising never tell lies. Um, <laughs> so this is, this is actually a problem that has been written about a whole bunch, and in fact, not abated. Uh, we were looking at that original Wired article, right? That was coming from the year 2016. And in 2016, that's what that size was. That was, that was overarching uh, doom. And we just kept going up from there. This is from the HTTP archive, who measures this kind of thing. And these web page file sizes just keep getting larger. They're not going down. The best we've got, uh, the last time I looked at this particular chart, we've got a plateau. So that's fine. Uh, but there's a reason why this chart is going into the red. There's actual problems that come from this. Um, and so you might be looking at this thing and you might be saying, well, wait, wait, what about Moore's Law? What about Moore's Law? Moore's Law, of course, is named after Julianne Moore uh, from The Big Lebowski. <laughs> I think, I don't know, I just think everyone should watch The Big Lebowski, and so that's just a, a plug for that. But, but Moore's Law, basically, you can go ahead and at me. But like Moore's Law, basically, uh, every two years, uh, computers double in speed. OK, sure, that was true at one point. That is uh, emphatically no longer true. That's not, how it, that's not how it works. And when you're talking about broadband speeds, yes, of course, those do get faster. But those do get faster incrementally. And those do get faster at the behest of telecom companies and cable companies, people we really trust and love. So. So if we look at broadband speeds in 2015, we can see that, in fact, yes, of course, like there is a lot of disbursement. There is a lot of disbursement. Some people have better connections. Some people have worse connections. But there is a, there is a, uh, uh, a range in there. And if we look at the thing in 2022, we can see that uh, the map turned blue. So that's uh, different. Uh, it used to be a different color shade. <laughs> I don't know why they did that to me, but now I get to make a joke out of it. But, but we can see that. Uh, spread throughout, you know, over over here, uh, things are looking uh, pretty fast. Over in the U.S., you know, things are looking all right. Western Europe, but this this disperse uh, this is a wide wide disbursement in kind of every single way. So in the speed test index, this is a, a research uh, project that's done by UCLA. They redo this every single year. But Norway, hey man, you're doing pretty good. You're doing pretty good. Uh, out of uh, uh, 181 countries. Uh, you're there with 100 megabytes download uh, uh, from broadband. Singapore up there on the top with number uh, with 219. Goes down to Chile, United States. There we are. Then you got Be then you got Norway. We go down to Belgium, uh, Germany, Croatia, Cuba. You can see the very same things that I can see. But you can see that there is very, very much a wide, wide range of speeds that are actually going to be happening. Now that of course is broadband. Things are a lot different on mobile. And in fact. I got a good piece of advice is that, uh, or a good piece to, of news to tell you is that Norway in mobile, you guys are actually number one. Uh, this is from the very same uh, research. Uh, you guys are pulling down 122 uh, megabytes on a, uh, on a, on a uh, national uh, mobile index, uh, which is actually better than the, uh, than the broadband connection. Um, <laughs> into uh, UAE uh, there and uh, Things go down uh, significantly from there, but but you know if you look at the actual variance from uh, Norway at the very top of the pile to India at the very bottom of the pile or nearly the very bottom of the pile, there's a couple underneath there. Um, we can see that there's uh, there's not even it's not a uh, democratic dispersal. But when you're talking about mobile, that's not actually the only metric because speed is a metric, but another metric is actual costs. Here's where it gets a little crazy. In Israel, and so this is uh, uh, put out by cable.co.uk, um, and they just go through all of the uh, per gigabyte uh, costs that are, that are associated. Now, there's a bunch of different ways to do that because some people actually like meter and some people limit and some people charge you by the gig, and there's a lot of different ways to do that. They try to normalize that whole thing out, bring that into US dollars, which I don't know why they do that because, well, I guess, you know what? I know why they do that, is that if they put it in pounds, <laughs> then uh, that number is going to change every five minutes because the pound just keeps getting worse. Uh, so they put that into dollars, which I then uh, put into kroner here. Israel, for a gigabyte, is charging half a kroner. Wow. Okay. 
So then into uh, Italy, we got three kroner, we got Denmark here at eight and a half, uh, Spain 13, Hong Kong 25, United States 36. Things are starting to get a little expensive here. We get into Norway, 63 kroner, and then finally <laughs> the Falkland Islands with 481 kroner. That's like half a beer, I think, in Norway. <laughs> And, and it is a real cost that's actually inferred by, uh, by people. Because, of course, you know, you, everyone has their plans, and their plans are set up, you know, however those plans are. And, uh, but you've got to think about the fact that, like, if you've got your wonderful, beautiful, art-directed photo that your designers are really, really super happy with, and you're like, I don't really need to do a picture element, I don't really need to do any sort of media queries, I'm just going to jam that thing in their phone. Well, number one, it's going to be slow, but the number two is that you're actually costing that person money. Like, you are literally costing that person money when you're jamming way too many megabytes down the pipe at somebody's mobile uh, connection. And there's another thing, too, is that we actually feel this. We feel this when we're pulling this down. So if we're talking about our three megabyte web page, our normal, uh, completely, completely normal three megabyte web page, okay, if I'm on a 4G connection, that's going to take about two seconds, I'm done. Okay, if I'm on a 3G+, plus, I'm going to have to wait a little bit, but eventually I'm going to be done. If I get to the 3G, okay, now that's going to actually take a while. When I get into the 2G connection, and that is a real connection, like that's not a hypothetical, like crazy outlying uh, connection. That is actually something that happens a lot in rural areas. Uh, people have sort of these spotty connections, and they end up pulling down that three megabytes in, in two minutes. We're never going to get to the done here. I have that gift to go off to say done when we get to two minutes, but I don't think we're going to see it because we're going to get bored and we're going to move on. And in fact, there's a whole bunch of data that people do, in fact, just move on. Um, does anyone know, uh, can I uh, raise a hand if you've heard the word bounce rate in your own professional capacity? Is that a normal thing? Okay, some, not a whole lot, not a whole lot. Okay, fantastic. So, so bounce rate is generally this idea of somebody loaded up your web page and they bounced. They left, they went, uh, you know, uh, I've, I've read some sort of tweet or I've read some sort of news article or whatever it is that landed me um, on your uh, web page. I was interested. For whatever reason that you, that you led me in, I got there. And then uh, the page started to load, stuff started to spin, stuff started to go kind of thing, or maybe it just had a white screen, and eventually I just bounced. Now, different people will measure this in different ways. Uh, Google's measurement is different than Cloudflare's measurement is different than, uh, uh, I don't know, Facebook just makes up numbers. But like, but like, <laughs> But different people have different measurements for what that looks like. So it could look like they never scrolled or they actually like left before the, um, before the actual initial page load uh, happened. But one way or another, they did bounce. And so, uh, so Pingdom actually did research and did, and did proper A-B testing to say like, okay, well, let's, let's compare apples to apples and let's take all of these pages uh, that are popular pages and let's just see, see if we throttle that network connection, see what happens. So they did this uh, to look at the very, very same web pages and say, okay, well, when this, when this time to load happens, uh, what will that do to your actual visitors? Now, you're going to have people, there's going to be marketing people out of there that, that are going to say like, uh, that, uh, oh, you know, we're going to get your bounce rate down to 0%. That's insane. I mean, that's, that's, that's insane. That's the kind of people that's like, oh, yeah, no, I'll get half your emails to be open. Come on. That's not a real number, and anyone who comes up with that kind of number is absolutely a charlatan. So you're not going to get an actual 0% bounce rate. That's not realistic. But, like, if you're under 10, you're doing pretty good. Under 10% bounce rate is pretty good. And, of course, in, in those levels, like when we're at our, you know, one and two seconds and that sort of thing, like things are pretty good. Once we start getting into that six seconds, which was – the 3G connection, right? That six seconds, we get to a 50% bounce rate. 50% bounce rate, which means that all of your advertising, all of your funnel, all of your whatever to try to like lead people in, you got half of the people that came to your page and went, no, just, just no. Like they, they found something better to do with their time. And, you know, I've been on the internet for quite a while. Sometimes there is better things to do than be on the internet. <laughs> Because the thing is that time actually is real. 
It's a thing that we live in. It's a thing that we experience. It's a thing that happens linearly. I am excited to be here. I've been excited to be coming here for, for months now, to come back to NBC Oslo. Last time was in the before times, and I was so excited to be here. And I hope that you are enjoying this much of the talk that I've given you. And hopefully, if you are enjoying it, maybe that time feels like it's going a little bit faster. Maybe that time is feeling good, but it's still progressing in a linear fashion. And we all know that this time is, in fact, finite. Okay, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. It's a little early in the morning to be talking about the finiteness of, of uh, time in general that all of us can experience. But hey, man, we're clever people. We're clever people, and we can do something about this. So this is a talk about easy wins. What I want to give to you is some stuff that you can walk away with. And there's two points to that that I want to talk about. Number one is that I don't want to bring you zealotry. Yeah, I've been doing website development for many, many years, as have some of the other people in this, in, this, uh, in this room. And you're going to be spending the next three days going to different talks, and people are going to have different advice because they've been in the field, and they've done different pieces of technology, and they've learned things along the way, and they've gotten excited, and they've jumped up and down, and they've said, like, oh, man, I found this thing. If you do it, if you do it, it's like, this thing is cooler. And that's great. Like, that's what this kind of conference environment is about learning about new tricks and going like, well, maybe I can use that, or maybe I can't use that in my current job, or maybe I can use that in my next job, or I can't use that at all, but it was neat. That's all fantastic and something that, is, that should be absorbed. Zealotry is something that's poisonous. When somebody says to you, I figured out the system, you freaks, and, and I know how to make a website, and I'm going to impose onto you my system for making a website, there is too much of that, especially in big tech right now, and those people should be discounted. The other thing is that I want to make minimal sacrifices here, so I want to try to like live inside of your projects and just try to move the needle a little bit. So let's start, let's start here with the easy stuff. It's a couple pieces of easy stuff, right? Because if we look at, and this is, uh, this is, all right, if you look at a pie chart and that pie chart has four slices, you know that the guy that built it was kind of fudging the numbers a little bit. So like, what I'm looking at is the actual layout of a website, or the actual uh, payload of a website uh, in general. This is a napkin sketch. It's definitely not something that I've cited on the bottom because I kind of like amalgamated a couple numbers to kind of figure out, well, you know, if we're talking about the top 100 or 1 million websites, like there's probably not that much HTML. Uh, there's actually probably a font load uh, if they've got Google Fonts or they got uh, Typekit, something like that. Uh, fair amount of CSS uh, and then a whole bunch of JavaScript. That's, that's what uh, these modern web pages look like. Except for we're missing a category. We're missing a category that is actually important. So if we take that same thing and we just go like that, oh, okay, well, all right. If we want to talk about where to cut, uh, we should probably go with the biggest offender first. Uh, videos are another thing, uh, but, but uh, these images, uh, they do create uh, some very real uh, constraints. So I'm going to walk through uh, a way to do this in Photoshop. If Photoshop is not part of your process right now, that's fantastic. Uh, there's plenty of other ways to do that I'm going to get to here after that. But if Photoshop is part of your workflow, uh, there is a way to sort of manage these file sizes down. So I don't know about y'all, but uh, another thing, keep just talking about stuff I love. I got breakdance and Big Lebowski. I'm sorry, I'm just sharing my love with you, that's all. Um, uh, another thing that I love is the uh, artist Bjork. I think, that, I think that Bjork, it's not like every album is listenable. Some of them are very, very much unlistenable. And like Bjork and Mike Patton together, oh my God, Mike Patton's amazing, Bjork is amazing. They put on an album that is unlistenable. <laughs> But I find Bjork to be a very true artist, and I appreciate that about her. But uh, I've got this picture of Bjork. I took this off of, I believe, Pitchfork, uh, and uh, it was not small. And so if I wanted to uh, save this image uh, that I took from wherever, and I wanted to uh, put this out on the web, uh, does anyone have a guess on where I actually want to click on in this particular menu? Any guess? Shout it out if you, if you have a guess. Export. Export. Interesting. So. That's close, but what we actually want is 
Well, actually, you know what? You are right, because there is a, there is a sub-navigation menu. Because if I go into export, then I've got this other thing called Save for Web Legacy. Because uh, eventually, at one point, Adobe went like, we're going to make this new way to like thing, to like uh, uh, have you uh, uh, minify images. And we're going to take all the controls away from you. Aren't you happy? Because we just made it one click. Uh, so now the new thing, or the, the thing that I used to use is now called Save for Web Legacy. So uh, here is uh, Save for Web Legacy, saved inside of the UI for Save for Web Legacy, because I'm just really, really clever like that. And we're just going to kind of go through what this looks like. So I've got my picture here. My picture is 2.5 megabytes, something like that. I'm going to go into Save for Web Legacy and just kind of go into this process. Now, if I go into uh, scrolling around here, if I go into the actual uh, UI, uh, I can look at different connections and just sort of like see how this thing is going to load. So on a 256 connection, I've got here, wow, at a one megabyte connection, I'm at 25 seconds. That's a long time to load a particular image. So I can kind of like look at you know, different uh, bandwidth sizes and sort of like see what this looks like. And then at that point, I can sort of play with quality. That's really what a lot of JPEG, uh, JPEG uh, compression is, is just sort of like playing with different quality settings to sort of figure out what's right. And again, I don't, don't want to make sacrifices. Bjork is, is, is a wonderful, lovely woman, and I don't want her to look weird. I just want that file size to be, well, I do want her to look weird. I always want her to look weird. That's part of the appeal. But I can kind of look at this side by side, and I can make sure that that I'm not really losing visible quality. There's nothing in this picture that like gets kind of dotty or you know like too rasterized or 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 fuzzy. I'm just trying to make that quality setting the way that it should be, so that I can just save this thing smaller. All I want to do is take that same thing, uh, bring that file size down, and then save that in the same folder as all of my uh, other pictures of Bjork because that's just in the folder that all my pictures of Bjork go in. That just goes into there. So having done the steps here um, in, this, uh, in this particular export thing, I took my initial file size at uh, 2.34 megabytes, uh, not small, and uh, just doing that particular interface, I brought myself down to 219 kilobytes. OK, that's 91% smaller. 91% smaller, and uh, I optimized that for a 1920 screen. So I, I personally feel that there's nothing in that, nothing in this image that is less than the initial image that I have. So that's one way to do it. And for those bigger hero images, uh, it's a worthwhile way to do it. But if you don't have Photoshop, uh, if you are one of the, you know, sort of like Figma people, there's a whole bunch of different like workflows. There's actually something else that we can do here. So I'm going to introduce you to Jake Archibald. Uh, Jake Archibald is one of uh, several, uh, just like, what, the, like Google has this thing where they kind of like just have like a couple of geniuses, like Jake Archibald and Paul Irish, and they're like, they're like, I don't know what's going on, so just I don't know, you go over there and figure it out. Uh, so Jake Archibald uh, works on the Chrome team, uh, made this thing called Squoosh, and Squoosh is a progressive web app. Uh, I do another talk on progressive web apps. They're fantastic. A progressive web app, uh, or rather, squoosh.app squoosh uh, is the place you can go to uh, for this thing. And we're going to kind of run through uh, with you uh, the, the general way to uh, go through this. So if I go to squoosh.app, uh, as I said, it's a PWA. So if I didn't actually have an internet connection, uh, I'd still be all right because it's built in Wasm. Uh, and we're all set. And so I'm just going to take my picture here. And I'm just going to uh, go into my folder. Uh, I probably have some pictures of Bjork. Yeah, sure, I got a picture of Bjork right here. OK, fantastic. So, so here's a picture of Bjork, which again uh, took off of some sort of, uh, some sort of music site. And I can see that having touched no buttons, having touched no buttons at all, having done nothing, I took my 4.74 megabyte JPEG, which, I mean, come on, seriously. I took my 4.74 megabyte uh, JPEG, and I brought that thing down 76%. So I can kind of go through uh, a whole bunch of different options. It's a tiny bit hard to see my screen here on the, uh, on the thing, but I can kind of pan around and start playing with these settings. So I can bring this quality down a little bit. Maybe I want to play around with my, um, with my uh, image size, because of course there's like WebP and stuff like that available. We're going to talk about image types in just a moment. Um, but there's different kind of like file sizes that I can kind of play with here. There's my JPEG XL. Uh, I've got AVIF. Hmm, interesting. Uh, so <laughs> you can kind of go through here uh, and bring down, uh, hey, how come? OK, well, who has this monitor? Like, why, 
Like, I know that this was brought into a 1440, uh, uh, you know, internal gutter, so you just jammed 3,900 uh, pixels of width on there. No, thank you. We're going to bring that thing down to, let's, let's pretend like this is going to live in a 1440 space uh, and uh, just kind of keep playing with this quality. We're down to a 95% decrease. And I can keep going, right? I can keep going and get to the point that, like, if I take this slider and I bring this quality down, like, significantly, and let's zoom in a little bit here. Um, so into, uh, you know, and you're looking at a TV, so it's going to be a little bit, a uh, little bit different. But I can see that once I'm at about 30, there's maybe a little bit of dithering that I don't necessarily love. And if I get down to here, then actually that looks pretty cool. Like, I actually like that. And I feel like I want to make like an ANSI, like, I don't know if y'all did BBSs in the day, but like, this is some Legend of the Red Dragon shit. Um, so like, that's nice, but like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of play with this sort of quality. That's actually kind of nice too. It's like this sort of effect. You could actually be doing this thing with like a progressive load thing as well, um, which is one of the things that uh, both uh, Moz JPEG and uh, WebP uh, support. But as essentially, you're just going to take this image, mess with it, Get it to the point that you're happy with it. You don't see a loss in quality, and, you, and you've extracted as many pixels out of it, and then go ahead and save that thing to desktop. Uh, at this point, I'm down to, eh, that's not really the level I would want. So I probably wanted it about, yeah, to my eye, yeah, to my eye, I feel like, I feel like this is about the right level, and that's got me at 130 uh, kilobytes. So smaller for sure. So uh, for those giant hero images, uh, for those, uh, those big, uh, beautiful pictures uh, that were put together and that we're really, really proud of, especially if you've got like text on the image, don't put text on the image. <laughs> put an image and put text on top of it. But man, sometimes it's outside of your control. So if you've got, if you got that kind of thing and you, and you need to get that quality down, uh, Squoosh, fantastic, fantastic option for that. But, but maybe you're thinking, well, like, Lemon, can't can I just do this automatically? Like, okay. I've got some giant hero image, or I've got some sort of like, huge thing that's like chunking everything down, and that's fine. But like, you know, maybe I work for like a retailer, and I've just got like a whole bunch of images, and I just don't want to mess around with that. You know, each individual one. Can I do this automatically? Yes, of course you can. Uh, so this is Dan. Uh, Dan lives in Seattle uh, and has worked for a whole bunch of companies, uh, but he made uh, this thing called uh, ImageBot. Uh, ImageBot is really neat because it's just a, uh, it's not a really GitHub action. It's actually just a bot that you sort of like add to your project as a collaborator. And then ImageBot just watches pull requests. So ImageBot will just sit there in the background, watch a pull request. Every time you got a pull request that comes through with a ping or a JPEG or whatever, WebP, it'll go like, uh, beep boop. Uh, oh, yeah, that was that thing. Uh, but then it'll go like, beep boop, your images are optimized. And so you're going to get some quality through this. So, so here is an image that I kind of like already optimized as well as I felt like. Uh, and, and it said, hey, I got another 5% uh, out of that. Now, that's great because I had to do absolutely no work. ImageBot will never, ever, ever be able to get the files as small as you could do with the, with the first process because the thing is, is that it's actually trying to do a perfect pixel match, right? So it's trying to make sure that like, it shrinks it down without any denigrating loss of quality. So it's measuring the quality of an image in the way that a computer would rather than you doing it in the way that your eye would. So it's not going to do as great of a job of shrinking this thing down as you probably will because it can't see the JPEG in the same way that you can, but it's going to get that down with basically no work. And I want to do basically no work as much as I possibly can. Um, another question I wanted to ask you is, uh, I don't know how many I'm going to call on, I'm going to get a raise of hands here. Uh, so I want to volunteer. So who knows the difference between JPEG, ping, and GIF? Raise of hands. Raise of hands. All right, all right. You, you right there, sir. Yes, yes. What is the difference between, between JPEG, ping, and GIF? Yes, uh, that's not a bad, yes, uh, portable, portable, uh, what, portable something graphics? I forgot what that actually stands for. Network. What's that? Network 
No, I think that's right. Yeah, portable network graphics. Uh, so, um, so that is uh, the the explanation. There was that uh, that that those uh, those distinctions exist. But but I actually wanted to say that you said um, you said at the end uh, that GIF uh, was for animation. Mostly used for animation. Uh, I would actually say that that's no longer true. So what, what I would say is that like, if, you're if you're looking at different image sizes and different ways that you want to do these things, uh, then you've got a JPEG. Now a JPEG is lossy, and that means that it's ideal for photos, uh, rectangles, resizable things. A lossy, uh, a lossy image format means that I want you to go ahead and scale that thing down or scale that thing up, and I'm okay with a little bit of blurring because there's not like exact clarity that I need. So if you want to fudge those pixels at different resolutions, that's totally okay with me. So, so ideal for photos, absolutely, uh, or, or, or you know any sort of like converted TIFF, or something like that, uh, a lossy uh, image type, uh, pretty smart move. A ping is lossless, um, so that's ideal for uh, drawings, screenshots, transparent backgrounds. By lossless, I mean that the compression is not supposed to be blurry. It's emphatically in the spec that it doesn't want to blur things. It doesn't want to, to smudge anything. It wants to do a lossless uh, compression as much as it possibly can. If we go into SVG, uh, uh, SVG is something that I just think is just the best. I just I love I love SVG. I think it's really really interesting, uh, and that's really great for like almost always the right cho your choice if you're doing icons or logos that sort of thing. Any sort of like line drawings. A lot of the stuff that you might be using pings for actually could be better in in in, um, in SVG. Asterisk, assuming that you actually have it vectorized and assuming that you don't have drop shadows and that sort of thing. Uh, but so things with limited complexity, SVG is really, really cool, not just because of the compression layer, but also because you can use it as a DOM element. So you can do an actual SVG and say, okay, this little rectangle gets to move on hover and this little thing gets to flip around. I want to transition. Everything inside of an SVG, if you actually render it in the DOM, you can play with it like any other uh, you know, div, uh, which I think is really, really exciting. Uh, and then there's GIF. Uh, and GIF, at this point, is used for basically nothing. And an MP4 is actually anything that you actually think is a GIF. So, at the point that uh, I, was, I was writing this talk at one point, and I sort of tweeted this thing out, and sneak preview of my upcoming talk, and went through this exact sort of like thing of uh, GIF is, is used for basically nothing. And a uh, friend of mine just responded immediately to me and says, uh, I love that the image uh, right up here is a GIF. <laughs> and I said, yeah, man, thanks for falling into my trap. That's actually not true. Uh, anytime that you're looking at a tweet and you see something that says GIF, that is a Twitter word that means that it's audioless and it loops, but it's actually an MP4. Um, Any time that you're looking at any animation at all ever, other than those people that do the hacks with like their profile thing as a GIF, I'm not exactly sure how they do that, but like any time that you're looking at a GIF on Twitter, uh, that is actually not a GIF at all. That actually is an MP4. In fact, Giphy. Giphy, which is named after the GIF. Giphy, which is the thing that makes Slack just a little bit more tolerable, <laughs> is actually never ever using, uh, using uh, GIFs. Uh, anything that's put inside of your Slack, when somebody responds with some sort of office meme or whatever, uh, that is never actually a GIF. That is a looping MP4. The Ministry of GIFs, which is a real thing that exists because the internet's great sometimes. Uh, the Ministry of Gift, which is a real thing, uh, does not purvey in GIFs. They purvey in uh, looping video that they call, um, uh, that they call GIFs. Uh, another uh, thing just to throw in there is that, uh, is that in all of those specs, you know, the, the sort of hard line is, is picking between the, uh, the, the lossy uh, JPEG and the uh, lossless ping. Uh, in the middle there is uh, WebP. Uh, WebP was a spec that was made by Google, and so the, uh, so the sort of adoption of it was a little bit slow played because Apple was like, that's a spec, and we didn't write it, so it stinks. Uh, and eventually they kind of gave up on that, so like WebP has some pretty wide support. It is a nice way to not have to make a decision because WebP will do uh, lossy, it will do lossless, it'll do both JPEG and ping, and it actually will do animation as well. And browser support at this point and this is only kind of now, but browser support at this point for WebP is pretty widespread. 
Image editors sometimes are a little bit farther back. In fact, Photoshop still has a problem with WebP, uh, but browser support on WebP is pretty good too. But of course, email doesn't follow any rules. So if you want to do if you want to do an animation uh, and you want that animation to exist inside of a, an email, yeah, yeah, write a GIF, write a GIF, and cross your fingers and rub some rosary beads. Like maybe maybe the email client will only display the first frame, and maybe that's okay. And Maybe you'll try to put some CSS in there, and that's always a mistake. And maybe there'll be another blog article about how email is catching up now. If you work in email, I respect you and I love you for it. And it's an interesting field because, like, there's no rules. There's no rules. It is chaos. If we look into the rest of our uh, image types, we can actually see where is the biggest chunk of that pie. And so if we want to make some improvements, We've got our, uh, our little bit of CSS, we've got our big old piece of JavaScript, and we can kind of see where we can go from there. And there's definitely ways that we can improve that thing out. Um, so I want to talk to you about text compression. So we can do text compression for HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and uh, we can do that usually with a very minimal amount of pain. So there's a, there's a way to triage this, uh, and there's three things of sort of uh, different complexity uh, that are worth triaging. The first is server-side compression. Uh, then we want to talk about bundling and minifying, minifying your code, and then considering CDNs. I'm not saying CDNs are always the right answer. I'm saying CDNs are frequently the right answer, but they're worth considering, uh, especially when you're thinking about performance. So the first thing is gzip. Uh, gzip is a server setting, and if you want to know how that works, man, that's simple. All right, all right. I'm not supposed to walk in front of the speaker, so I definitely won't. But uh, gzip, uh, if you look at it, it, it looks like uh, this. So um, helium <laughs> equals, I think that's epsilon, uh, paragraph tag. I know log means logarithm. Uh, I kind of remember what a logarithm is. I guess that's the square root of something like that. OK, I have no idea exactly what that says. And in fact, I actually watched an entire talk uh, with, <laughs> with Raul Frail at JSConf EU. Uh, telling me about how uh, gzip worked, and I still didn't quite pick it up. Uh, but what I did understand was that there's there's sort of like a couple of different algorithms that sort of like figure out you know the repeating parts of code, and they do their best to very much minify that. So so in the concept of in the same way that you would have a zip file, uh, gzip will say, okay, well I've got all of this data, and then I want to send it to the client, so I'm going to compress this thing down with uh, with my, uh, I'm going to compress a little packet of code, and I'm going to give it a key of like, here's how you uncompress the code. I'm going to send all of that over the wire, and then on the other side, your browser goes, okay, well, cool, I've got this, and I'm going to uncompress that thing. Uh, and I mean, honestly, it just works. You've got less bits over the wire, so you should turn it on. Uh, in a lot of hosting systems, uh, that is actually on by default, but that's not always the case. Also, there are totally other things, uh, like for example, Brotly, I think that's how it's pronounced, uh, is another compression algorithm. I think that there's other ones that exist out there. But whatever it is, and I would never, ever, ever pick a horse. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to uh, figure out what that thing is. And so I'm not going to pick a horse about like, which is the actual best compression algorithm. But I'd say one way or another, you should be turning that on, making sure that you're minifying that to the user, because it's the computer doing work. It costs you nothing. It's absolutely the way to go. The second thing is bundling and minifying. This is where it gets a little bit more complex than that because we've got a couple of things that we actually might want to do here. So there's a reason to bundle your code. So maybe you've got like this thing that like you know does an accordion, and then you've got like this thing that like does like your drop downs, and then you've got this thing that runs a carousel because you tried to tell your designer several times that carousels actually perform really badly and you showed them all the data. Please don't make me write a carousel. Please don't make me write a carousel. And sometimes you lose that battle. So yes, you're writing another carousel and you have to write a whole bunch of JavaScript for that. And so we've got these different packets and you can do those discreetly because maybe we've only got this thing on this page and that's okay. But if we've got a whole bunch of different scripts that we want to load, we actually want to bundle those together. And the reason is actually a math problem that I do understand and that is this, that 100 kilobytes is actually less than 10 times 10 kilobytes. Essentially because if you've got a situation where you've got the HTML page and then that's doing a bunch of requests, right? I need all of the CSS, I need all of this JavaScript, and I need all of this, you know, these image requests. It's going to be doing all of those, fetching all of those uh, in a queue. 
It's going to queue those things the best way that it can figure out how. It's going to try to run them concurrently. If you're doing this on HTTP2, uh, there's multi-threading, and so it's going to try to be doing this as quickly as possible. But no matter what, if you're making more requests, you're actually going to slow things down because it has to start and stop every request as well as fold that into what is called the paint system. So as much as you can, if you can bundle these things and make fewer requests, you're going to just save some time right there. The other thing is minification. And if you're thinking about why is it, why is it a good idea to minify, uh, I don't know about you all, I, I, I'm a front-end dev, uh, and, uh, and I use Moment all the time. I use Moment all the time, and then the reason why it's a JavaScript uh, package and the reason why I use Moment is that I hate time zones. They don't make sense. I, like I had on my on my uh, my my calendar here that I was uh, that I was starting this at 9:30 because apparently there was some different time zone thing that was happening. Time zones do not make any sense to me, and they never will. And Moment figures that thing out for me. So if if I want the the actual time as it is relevant to your thing, I'm going to use Moment. If I get the actual uh, uncompressed library, that's going to be 148k. That's big. That's big. Uh, but the minified version is 51k. Okay, well, that's, I mean, that's definitely three times smaller. There's other smaller ways to do that. Sometimes uh, people will argue that moment is too big to reach. If you're just trying to do something where you're just trying to like output a date, they're absolutely right. Uh, moment's probably too big if you're just trying to do sort of like simple stuff. But minification is always going to create situations that are going to be even, even sped up uh, by gzip. So then if we're looking at the concept of minification and you want to be doing that, then there's the question of, well, how do I do that? And that's where I do not have a clean answer for you. I don't have a clean answer for you because like, it really genuinely super depends on what your system is. And I don't know what any of your uh, particular texts look like. If you've got a situation where you've got uh, you know, uh, Webpack or Snowpack or that sort of thing, uh, that's definitely something that will do uh, JS minification and compression. Does a really good job of that. Uh, I kind of like more of the, the school of the grunt and gulp. I know that's old-fashioned. That's OK. Sometimes I like to write old-fashioned code. And I, that's another way to do that, uh, to just sort of like set those pipes. Uh, in, the, in the super blazy uh, modern uh, system with your, uh, with your Vite and your Astro, um, those will absolutely be doing all of that minification as well. Uh, those are usually settings that are turned on by default, especially in the Vite and Astro thing. But you, know, you might want to check if they are to see what the minification looks like. Uh, those Vite and Astros will also give you the um, uh, sort of little pretty charts of like how much your code has been minified. Uh, but there's another thing that I want to do uh, that I want to offer you is that like if you don't have uh, that thing, if you don't have uh, if you don't have Webpack because Webpack is not my friend ever, um, and if you don't uh, if you don't have a gulp system or any sort of like pipeline to do this, then I actually want to show you this thing called Prepros. Uh, Prepros is actually gulp in in a UI. Um, as I said, I'm a front-end developer. I write a lot of code. I just don't actually like to use the command line very often. I mean, I do. I do use the command line. But like, I use that GitHub desktop app because like, I want to click on buttons. I, I don't want to actually do the CLI stuff if I can avoid it. If CLIs are great for you, that's fantastic. Uh, but if CLIs are not necessarily your friend, if you do have a situation where you do want to do um, you know, uh, uh, another topic that we could talk about is SAS. Uh, or pug, uh, also very, very good. Uh, you can do this thing, uh, prefrost. It's basically just gulp in a UI. Uh, you kind of have this little program uh, that's just running all the time. You say, hey, man, I want you to watch uh, this one folder. Anytime I change this file, you know, do the rules that, that require. And so it's going to just continually happen on save, which is how gulp and stuff works. And then also has a r live reload function. So that means that you can be editing uh, SAS files. You go like uh, background color pink because you're feeling stylish. And then the thing is actually going to re live reload up. Um, so I think if you don't have another system, if you do have another system, that's fantastic. If you don't have another system, this is a really, really good option. There's a Mac-only one called CodeKit, which is also, uh, which is also totally viable. Uh, there is a price to this. I forget. I bought it years ago. I think it's like 30 bucks. I'm not sponsored, uh, but I'm just saying that like this has been uh, something that I've used pretty regularly, uh, just to kind of like spin up those quick projects uh, without a whole bunch of, you know, because nobody wants to like start writing the code and then just spend spend ten minutes of like, okay, I'm gonna have a little workflow stuff. No, I want to write code. I want to write code. And then there's CDNs. There's a lot of different CDNs. There's a lot of different CDNs. 
CDN JS, you got JS Deliver, there's Google hosted libraries. I probably could list like 40 more, not off the top of my head, but I guess if I, if I searched around for them, there's a whole bunch of CDNs. And I think that they are worth considering. And there's two reasons, there's two reasons that I think CDNs are worth considering. Reason number one, uh, is that uh, the CDN is probably faster than your servers. Now, I don't know where you work. I uh, work for a fairly small uh, company uh, in uh, North Carolina, actually, where I do not live. I live in Minnesota. Uh, but I work for a, a fairly small company. Uh, you know, our hosting uh, will change uh, per client, but, you know, we, we put our servers up on whatever. We usually have a single actual server uh, that people will hit. And so... I will never, <laughs> I think, I mean, unless things change, I will never be working for a company where our tech is faster than Cloudflare. I don't think that's going to happen. And so if I can be using their servers and I can, and I can know that, like, if somebody is, uh, you know, uh, coming at my website from Port-au-Prince and they can get a C CSS file that's actually served close to Port-au-Prince, then that's what I want to do. So those things, a CDN is almost always, depending on your setup, is almost always going to be faster than the, than the speed at which your company can deliver these files. The other thing that's really important to think about is that your users actually probably already have jQuery. Not probably. Your users, if they've turned on their computer, have jQuery from a CDN. Because as long as, as they've visited a website, and I'm a stan, man. I, I, I know this is controversial. I still write in jQuery. I do. I do. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I still think it's nice. But like, but but if somebody's coming at your website, I just lost like, f I, I just I just physically saw like six people right over here when I said I still use jQuery. I know. I feel you. I know. I know. I know. It's bad. It's bad. I still do it. But like, but I'm always going to be serving that from a CDN because as long as I'm actually having them hit the same CDN that some other website hit, then that payload is free. That payload is free because that's already cached in their system, which means the only thing, and I'm just talking to the couple of you that hang your head right there, the only thing that I just gained is that by not having to pick up jQuery, I actually get to save a couple bytes by writing dollar dot whatever, then like document get element by ID. I mean, we're shaving hairs here, but I did actually save like a couple bytes, and at least that's what I tell myself when I continue to write jQuery. <laughs> Uh, another person I want to introduce you to is saying Paul Irish, uh, another person that sort of jumped around in a bunch of different Google projects. Um, and one of the things that he did not exactly helm, uh, but was uh, instrumental in building, is something that's getting used a lot, which is Lighthouse. And Lighthouse is, if you're trying to make uh, gradual performance improvements, is definitely uh, a, a friend. So uh, you actually already have this if you open up Chrome. And by Chrome, I actually don't just mean Chrome. I mean anything that's Chromium. So you know, your Vivaldi, your Opera, your uh, uh, um, Brave. Brave. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, there's, a, you know, there's a bunch of other. Edge, Edge actually, Edge actually now uh, Chromium. Anything that you have that is Chromium-based um, has uh, Lighthouse in it. So if you go ahead and uh, we're going to go to, I'm just going to pick on NDC Oslo. Uh, right here, and we're just going to uh, look at this particular page. So here's a page, profile speakers, la 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 la, lots and lots of pictures. Let's just see how this does. Now there's one thing that I want to tell you right up, uh, right up front, which is that there's a score. Lighthouse gives you a score. What I would caution you to is ignore the score, at least at first. What we want to try to do is just make some improvements. So. Here's some people that I like quite a bit, uh, but we're just going to go ahead and take this thing down. There's different categories to this. Um, uh, also, in, in the topic of progressive uh, web apps, uh, Lighthouse will do a really good job of, of, uh, of giving you a score for progressive web apps. I did another talk. It's probably online somewhere, I think for NDC. Actually, yes, for NDC, uh, if you're interested. But um, we can do that thing. But we're going to go into uh, their SEO thing is fine, their accessibility. Nope, don't use that. It's not, or, uh, not, don't use theirs is what I'm saying. I don't think that Lighthouse does the best job in that. But we're going to do the performance. We're going to do that down into the mobile and uh, just kind of spin this up. So this is going to take a minute uh, where it sort of like emulates. In this case, it's going to emulate the actual phone display. It's going to emulate a lousy connection. Uh, it's going to get flaky uh, and just try to kind of break the thing. Now, as I said, the first thing that you get is a score. And you're going to want to just point to your score. 
And again, I'm not trying to, I love NDC, I really do. So I'm not trying to make fun of them for their score. I'm just saying that there's improvements that can be made. And if we scroll down, that's where the thing that matters. So a couple of these measurements uh, are uh, first contentful paint. Um, so that would be uh, when, uh, when the browser has all the information that it has or, or the, all the information it thinks to connect on, it does what's called a paint, which means like, I'm going to draw these boxes, I'm going to put these things inside of the boxes. There's the first contentful paint, and then there's the time to interactive. Um, and then there's uh, a couple of different phases here of contentful paints. So we can see that some of these things are in the red. We can see a timeline, but the thing that's actually the most important thing to me about Lighthouse is this bit right down here. Because in this bit, it's actually saying, okay, well, I gave you the score, and I've got some opinions, and you know, Google's mad at you for a couple things or whatever, but then we can actually go into, well, what can I do? And it actually triage this, of like, is like, here are some performance increases that you could be doing right now that are meaningful. So the very first thing um, is, is that it wants us to defer uh, offline or defer uh, images that aren't in the DOM or in the in the window, which totally makes sense. Uh, there's a whole bunch of pictures on this particular page. That's one of the reasons why I picked it. Uh, and so if we actually took through and we went through all of those images and we just went uh, image uh, attribute uh, loading equals lazy, uh, then at that point the browser is going to try to defer uh, loading all of these pages until it's actually not even in the page. It's going to be close. So like if you do a lazy load, it's going to be it's going to wait until you're like a little bit off screen, and then it'll try to lazy load those images in. Uh, so with that, you're actually going to be gaining a fair amount because it doesn't have to do the paint on these images. It doesn't have to load these images. It's not going to try to. And instead, it's going to get stuff like your JavaScript, like your CSS instead and prioritize that over uh, the lazy loaded images. Um, we've got some uh, reduced unused JavaScript. I'm not even going to read into that because like, I don't know, but like, but like there's Clearly, some JavaScript is not being used on this page. That could go away, and then it starts to get into like uh, next-gen image formats. That's Google saying, please use WebP. Um, but there's, there's different things, and so when you're looking at uh, going up to that, that first score, skip past it at first. Skip past it and just get into, like, well, how can I actually improve this thing? How can I make marginal improvements to this thing? How can I just move the needle, like, 2%, make a little bit of improvement? And over time, that number will just get better. Rather than obsessing over the number, just try to, get, just try to make those incremental improvements to try to make that number a little bit better. Ooh, coming up on time. Fantastic. Anyone know who this is? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, this is this is Margaret Hamilton, um, and she essentially got America to the Moon. Uh, there's a more complicated answer, but Margaret Hamilton, she wrote code that got us to the moon. Um, so this is uh, a tweet uh, by Thomas Fuchs uh, that says, "Legendary Apollo project programmer Margaret Hamilton next to a printout of her Node modules directory first first Hello World app." <laughs> okay, yeah, you're right. That is a very funny tweet. That is a very funny tweet. Uh, and congratulations, Thomas Fuchs, for that very funny tweet. However, Gary Bernhardt actually went through here and did the math. So he looked at this thing and he went, well, okay, hang on a second. So how big is a piece of paper? And like, what can we assume is a font size? And like, what can we assume is the actual, let's take a monospace font. Maybe it's fire code or whatever. Like, let's take this and let's figure out how many characters we can fit on a page. Is the page double-sided? And he starts to do a whole bunch of math to try to figure out, well, okay, we're going to take this node modules uh, of, uh, of Hello World React, and we're going to try to figure out uh, how many pages this would actually take. So he goes through and kind of like shows all of his work and like here is my assumption of how thick a page is, here is my assumption for how many words fit on the page, and he finally, after doing all of that math, came back around and said, returning to the original photo of Margaret Hamilton standing next to a printout of a node modules directory, the paper is about as tall as her. Therefore, Margaret Hamilton is almost 18 feet tall. This is Hello World in Vue, React, and Angular. This is, this is boilerplate starting code. Angular is a little bit cheaty in this particular regard because Angular will come with it uh, material, and so you'll get those material icons, so that's the reason why that one ends up being a little bit big. Um, but what we have is three different package sizes that we get from doing NPM, Create, React, bleh, and we did that thing, and we have yet to write a piece of code. I work a lot with junior developers. I work a lot with junior developers, and 
I get into situations where those junior developers need to change you know, a uh, source in the head tag and they don't know how to do it. They've built a website and they actually do not know how to change like a CSS source because it hasn't been exposed to them because there's so many files and so many folders that have been written for them by geniuses and so they're just not possibly figuring that thing out. From that measurement of uh, 222 megabytes that happens in Angular before uh, we've actually written line one of code, we were talking about Doom earlier. So that, that install right there, that 221 megabytes, that means that if I do create Angular app, that is as big as SimCity 2000 plus Papers, Please, plus Minecraft, plus an army of me on 256 kilobytes. We got here on purpose, I suppose, or, we, or whatever the case is, we got here. And we need to figure out how to get through this thing. We need to figure out how to own our code. We need to figure out how to ship less code. And there is one thing that I would implore you to do, which is write HTML, write HTML. No matter what, no matter what, your browser will need to absorb HTML. It will need CSS, JavaScript, and HTML, no matter what your tech stack is, that's what it's going to come down to. If you get to write that code, you get to control some of that thing that happens. So please, please, as much as you can, write HTML and CSS. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Lemon.